The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us. We have a terrific discussion ahead. Great to have my co-hosts here, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. Elliot, uh, why don't we start with you? All right. Thank you, John. So it's a uh, proxy season right now. It's also Berkshire annual uh, meeting season. And it's obviously, as you all know, I'm, I've been heavily involved in Twitter for a long time. And it's Twitter getting taken over season, which has very interesting ramifications. And, you know, I've described this uh, outcome as bittersweet. And then depending on which minute you catch me, uh, you know, I might say it's extremely bitter, or I might say it's a little bit sweet. And the sweet has more to do with the environment than the outcome on the company itself. I'm actually quite frustrated. And I think, you know, um, I love the band Radiohead. And I thought it was funny when Jack tweeted out Karma Police about, you know, alluding cryptically to the situation. And then, you know, uh, earlier this week, he tweeted out the song Everything in Its Right Place, which is a fantastic song, by the way. Kid A is a great album. You know, go listen to it and all. Um, he, he tweeted it out and then went on this mini rant following it. And I really did not like it. He talked about this notion that the biggest problem for the company was how um, Wall Street and the ad model uh, didn't let it be what it was supposed to be. And I can't help but be annoyed at the fact that, A, you know, you get the shareholders you deserve, and B, um, Jack was CEO for seven years now in his second stint. And there were a lot of shareholders, myself included, who had been saying, like, go give us a subscription model. You know, you don't need just the ad model. Do something in subscriptions. You have a logical product for that in TweetDeck. Go make something happen. And during COVID, um, when they talked about having to create more resiliency in their revenue streams, um, he was asked point blank at the annual meeting of Twitter in March of 2020 saying, hey, you know, why don't you, sorry, it was May of 2020, why don't you do a subscription plan for TweetDeck? And he's like, eh, you know, maybe we could, maybe we won't, but everything I know about this situation, he was the single biggest bottleneck to actually going the subscription route. And he led an investor day in early 2021, premised around how the company did things wrong in the past, but they're doing things right now, and how the ad TAM is so damn big, and they're going to attack it. So if that was the problem for the company, and it was because of Wall Street, what the hell was he doing? Where's his integrity in the matter? Uh, and he furthered the rant by saying, you know, uh, maybe Twitter never should be public, it should be a utility. That should be open source and yada, yada. But dude, you're on the board still. Um, and they actually had to update this in a proxy filing about the merger. Uh, tweet, they, they, they had to do an image uh, uh, of his tweet storm. Uh, dude, you're on the board. You're saying this stuff. You were CEO before. Like, If this is what you really believed, what are we supposed to think about what you told us all the while? And you know, I think the board... Um, kind of caved to Elon Musk's demands without ever really looking to see if they could get a better deal, without even negotiating a go shop in the deal. Um, I, you know, it's really frustrating from a governance perspective. Like, what was the board thinking? And perhaps it's that Silver Lake will find a way to roll their equity and position themselves alongside Musk because they were the ones who were rumored to have uh, perhaps 
secured the funding in the infamous funding secured incident. Um, and perhaps Elliot Management, who no longer, not to be confused with me, Elliot, they're the 2T Elliot, uh, they they no longer have a board seat, but they uh, helped pick their replacement on the board. So they do have representation, whether it's formal or not. Um, maybe they get an opportunity to roll their equity. Maybe Jack's going to roll his equity with Musk. Uh, who knows? But it seems like a major colossal failure of governance in all respects. Um, and go figure today, Twitter reported their earnings, and they are actually on a better track on users than had been indicated at all at any time since they had set that target out there. So of all times to sell, why now? Why not at least like try to achieve some of your ambitions, show that you can deliver, and then find a better deal? None of it makes sense to me. So anyway, you know that's one instance of governance. And you'll have noticed perhaps the special edition of the podcast that happened in between this recording and last recording where I did a Twitter spaces uh, talking about the governance in the PayPal situation and the opportunity uh, that the stock presents in a situation where you could have uh, a door being open to an activist who could actually change things around. I urge you all to follow uh, non-gap, uh, handle at non-gap on Twitter. The guy is a, a brilliant analyst and really has opened my eyes to how you could use uh, your analysis of uh, the proxy statement and of, you know, read the players, read what they're doing and get insights from an investment lens. But anyway, wanted to open it up to you guys as well to talk about governance generally and maybe some of these situations specifically. Well, yeah, this, so uh, I guess a couple of disclosures. One is that I don't own... Twitter, right? I've, I've not owned it at any point. I don't own it currently. I also don't like criticizing by name. It's it's a it's a difficult world out there. We're all trying to do our best, and uh, I'm certainly not perfect. I've made many mistakes. I'll make many more. But that said, we talked about this kind of over the course of the last few days. I, I started spitting nails when I started reading. Jack Dorsey's tweets about this stuff. Uh, I pulled it up right now. Uh, this was so we're recording this on April 28th. This was April 25th. He said, "You're right." He started with the Radiohead thing. He said, "I love Twitter. Twitter is the closest thing we have to global consciousness. The idea and service is all that matters to me, and I will do whatever it takes to protect both." Twitter as a company, emphasis on company. Company there is mine. Has always been my sole issue. <laughs> Never mind the other company I was running at the same time. And my biggest regret, it has been owned by Wall Street and the ad model. Taking it back from Wall Street is the correct first step. In principle, I don't believe anyone should own or run Twitter. It wants to be a public good at a protocol level, not a company. Solving for the problem of being a company, however, and Elon is the singular solution I trust. I trust his mission to extend the light of consciousness. So where to start? Uh, there's more levels of BS in that statement than we could possibly dissect in one sitting. And I think this all boils down to incentives. As, as you were kind of getting at, Elliot, I mean, the, the governance here, we'll, we'll come back to the, the specifics of the merger and how this all played out. But the incentives of the governance here are what truly make me want to puke because this company's been public now for how long? Like a decade at least, right? When was the IPO, Elliot? Yeah, it was a decade ago, exactly. Yeah, a decade ago. So the whole time you've been a fiduciary to the public shareholders that own this company, you've always thought that was a bad idea. Now You're now going to tell us that despite all of the assurances, all of the sworn and legally binding statements you've made to the contrary, you always thought this was a bad idea. And oh, by the way, the company's been paying hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of stock-based compensation every year taking money from one hand and putting it in the other with the public shareholders in between. And you thought this was a whole bad idea the whole time along. I was just looking at this from the numbers you were just referencing. Stock-based compensation expense grew 60% year over year. And it was $177 million. That's 15% of total revenue this company's paying out in stock-based compensation. And he thinks this isn't a company, shouldn't be a company, and it certainly shouldn't be a public company, of course. I mean, give me a break. This is just a complete and total failure. This is a joke. This is beyond disingenuous. This is just bad faith. 
And uh, I, one prediction I'm willing to make here is that everybody involved from the company side, both Elon and the company itself, seems to think this is some sort of solution. I, I guess I should limit that to the board members who voted for it and the senior management and Jack who are in favor of it. God knows there's plenty of employees who are not in favor of it. But I'm willing to go out on a limb here and say that this will not go well for any of those parties. I think the employees who stick around are going to be in for one heck of a ride, as anyone who's ever worked at Tesla or SpaceX or the Boring Company or Solar City or anything else could attest. And I think uh, the new owners are going to, and, and by that I do mean to include plurals, uh, because Morgan Stanley and whoever comes in in the equity syndicate here are going to have a role are going to have a much bumpier ride than they're expecting. Uh, not only has this company been kind of building a technological and code-based debt for a long time that they're now going to try to fix with a magic wand in short order, but they now have a massive financial problem. I mean, the interest burden alone here is going to consume a massive amount of the current revenue base, and there, there's just no way around generating some form of money to keep this thing going unless you're going to default and hand the keys back to Morgan Stanley in short order. So, and and, and that doesn't even begin to, to touch on the problems you're going to have with this whole, I'm just going to have free unfettered access to information. And I use free in quotation marks there. Uh, I, I think this is going to be an unholy mess. And I think we'll be talking, laughing, crying about this for the next several years, because I just, I, I don't see how this ends well, personally. I'll, I guess I'll jump in on, on Twitter as well before we move on to other governance uh, topics. You know, it's it's kind of crazy that you have a company of this size doing this kind of a sale process. It's not really even a process. It's just someone came up with a number. There's not even a rationale behind that number. Um and the board agreed to that. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever seen that before. And I've seen a, a, quite a few M&A deals happen, uh, sales processes happen and things like that. So uh, I'm not sure that we've seen the last of what's happening here. Although um, I am worried that if the major activists here, uh, Silver Lake and Elliot with two Ts, um, kind of get to roll their equity, um, who's going to stick up for the other shareholders? Uh, so ultimately, um, you know, that that may not happen. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, you know, Phil, I am uh, much more cynical than you are on, on how well Elon's going to do here. You think it's going to be a, a, a problem child for him, but I actually think he's going to make out like a bandit here. I actually think that Twitter has tons of monetization potential. Um, you know, he could even just throw some Tesla money Twitter's way. I mean, if he's going to own uh, a huge chunk of Twitter equity, it's in his interest to throw Tesla money at Twitter. And um, and that's just one one kind of insignificant example, but what I think will ultimately happen, or there's at least a good chance of, of it happening, is that, you know, Musk will, after a while, you know, basically say, you know what, it's not a great idea to have a billionaire like me controlling this whole free speech issue. I don't want to make these judgments. We're just going to IPO the company again. And it's going to come out at like a hundred plus billion valuation and the market's going to eat it up. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Look, that could very well prove to be true. I, I wouldn't place more than 60, 40 odds on, on my prediction. I, and look, I, I, I would put strong odds on that if this does go well, that he will act like the ultimate private equity flipper and IPO this thing in a few years, for sure. I could totally see that. I'm 100% on board with you there. I just think there's just going to open a can of worms that nobody is prepared to deal with. I, I just, this, this company was already tough to manage and already undermanaged, and I just don't see that getting better, but I could certainly be wrong. Wait, John, you're saying there's not, there wasn't rationale to the price just by putting a number in front of 420, right? Like no rationale there? What? Um, but I'm in your camp too. I think this is absolutely going to work well. Um, I think there, 
was some degree to which the organization needed a certain kind of ruthlessness and a bit of a shakeup that, you know, I seemingly Jack must have recognized and hadn't been willing or able to do himself for whatever reason. Um, and I think they were very much on the brink of realizing certain degrees of uh, strength on the revenue side. One of the questions I've had always, like a counterfactual question, but was never provable, is would Twitter have delivered the exact same revenue growth had they not changed the expense trajectory at all? I.e., before expenses had grown, you know, roughly in line with revenues, but had they not grown expenses at all, would revenues have continued to grow anyway? And I'm deeply of the belief that yes, revenues would have continued to grow anyway. And I think in general, a lot of what the market's experiencing right now, I've been thinking this through and to kind of make a broader point about it, but like in COVID, a lot of companies that had strong trend heading in, had a step change in revenue. And then what they did was they step changed following revenue. Um, so called 2020 a revenue surge. So you had really strong margins. 2021, they stepped up their uh, operating expense base. And what happened is toward the end of 2021, you saw growth start to slow. And yet they kept pushing the operating expense base. So what you had to happen was slowing revenue growth into rising expenses, so margins collapsing pretty quickly in a lot of these growthier names. Meanwhile, you zoom out longer term, and everything's pretty consistent on a trend, but today you have the market valuing some of these companies on what you'd say is um, you know, slowing growth and falling margins, which is a really toxic combination. Now, there's a second degree to this problem, which is for some of these companies, you very much have pulled forward uh, the realization of something closer to terminal growth for another cohort of these companies, you know, you're you're just going to have to wait till the back half of this year to get back to a more balanced relationship between expenses and revenues and, and trend growth, right? Um, and I think Twitter was one of those companies that was kind of better positioned for that more balanced relationship at the other half of this year, though, had they made some tougher choices, perhaps you'd have seen revenue continue to grow without having needed the uh, rampant expenses. And I think Musk is exactly the person who's going to be able to do that. You know, say what you will about him. He's been able to achieve a lot on a pretty lean budget and get to a certain point in Tesla that, that I think even the most optimistic people hadn't believed, let alone the bears. You know, they're way more profitable than the best case I'd seen presented by some of the people who'd been short this. Uh, a long time ago. So give the guy some credit. He's been able to squeeze squeeze a lot of juice out of like some pretty uh, pretty drained lemons, if you will. Yeah, what I'll say there, though, is like I, you said the word counterfactual, which is immediately got me going. Like, I agree. I don't want to take away from the accomplishments at Tesla and certainly not at SpaceX. But there were many, many times when Tesla was broke. He tried to sell the company and failed. He was three weeks away from bankruptcy by his own admission about four years ago. I mean, this was an almost impossible task. And just because he pulled it off through a combination of luck and skill does not mean that it's repeatable or that there are other lessons here, right? I mean, the survivorship bias of the people we talk about who take on long odds and wins means we don't talk about the many, 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 many who took on long, long odds and failed miserably. And I would argue that turning around Twitter might not be as difficult as what he's pulled off with Tesla, but it's certainly difficult. And I don't see anything about his prior track record being indicative of success when it comes to something like Twitter, frankly. So the other thing out, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to real quick on Twitter. I mean, just kind of a, a I guess a sound bite, but you know, how do we see Twitter innovation? I mean, how much, has there been back and forth on an edit function? You know, I feel like Twitter could just fire ninety percent of its employees, and no one would even notice. It could be like a like a Yahoo Finance, where like ten years later, nothing has happened on the platform, but people still use it. And yeah, this is a soundbite; it's an exaggeration. But the point is, I feel like Elliot's absolutely right. There's so much bloat in the expense base that you could squeeze out some very easy uh, free cash flow just by just by rationalizing the uh, employee base. And I think a lot more companies should generally be thinking like, you know, drive your growth, then bring your expenses up with it. Drive your growth and then bring expenses 
up with it. Like push returns, think about returns, not just growth at all costs. And I think, you know, over the last couple of years, a lot of companies flipped that on its head and we're like, oh, let's push our revenues to, let's push our expense to try to drive growth. And then you don't know if you're getting any return on it or not. Um, that, and that's all true, but I thought this wasn't a company. This was a platform for free speech. <laughs> and we, don't, we, don't, we don't care about profits. We don't care about margin. I mean, that's why this is such nonsense, right? Like nothing that's said is true. Nothing that needs to stand to reason is even bothered to be considered, right? I mean, it's all just a, it's performance art, right? <laughs> and, and, as, and as long as he drives the narrative, I mean, I think you were absolutely right, Elliot. This is about meme production, right? This is about fun stuff to do. This, this has nothing to do with, you know, free speech or bettering the world or anything else. Yeah. I mean, one fundamental fact about Musk and Tesla as well is that he spent not a dime on marketing until, you know, very recently and it's very small, right? To have built a trillion dollar company, but forget, forget I said a trillion dollar, right? It's, it's a really big company um, on no marketing. I think he recognized the amount of value you could, you could create using Twitter, the platform. And the always uh, stated joke is that more value has been created on, on Twitter than by and for Twitter. Um, and, you know, perhaps he sees that it might not be Twitter itself where, where Musk tries to create and drive the value. It might be that he realizes he could drive value for his other companies and his other initiatives. Um, who knows? I, you know, I'm just speculating here. Um, but, but I do think he's going to create some very real value at Twitter. And I'd say it's not a turnaround anymore. Like most of the turn, the turnaround's done. Um, it's just a question of how they want to optimize themselves functionally speaking. Like the tech debt's gone, the platform's in much better place. Um, it's growing its user base as quickly as ever in a non pandemic situation. Like the growth they put up this morning on the earnings number was better than basically any other period outside of, uh, COVID in the very, very early days as a public company. Um, and so, you know, it's actually in a pretty good place, all things considered. But it, you talk about creating value. I'm, I'm now curious, like what, what is going to be the source of that value if they don't care about the company as an economic model and they think they're too beholden to advertising and Wall Street? Where is the, what's the source of the value? Well, I don't truly see it going that way, but like Musk's tweets have immense value for Tesla. And for SpaceX and for influencing policy. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So you're just talking about his aggregate little fiefdom, not for the company itself. 100%. I'm yeah, saying yeah. that's okay. a possibility. Oh, I absolutely. totally agree. No, I think that's probably his main goal, right, is to be both a Trojan horse under the guise of, quote, free speech, and then just to maintain this massive public, you know, Carnival Barker outlet that he's got that is, is truly powerful. I'm not disputing the power of the platform. I'm just disputing the... You know how disingenuous the commentary is, and and what the true aims are here. But and, and then again, I just, I mean, you're right. I mean, if if the strategy is to just siphon money out of Tesla and pump it into Twitter, that's one way to go about it for sure. And he, he has that right and that ability. But otherwise, like if you're going to start cutting back on advertising and don't have a great way to monetize the user base otherwise, whether it's subscriptions or whatnot, you have a massive interest burden here. So how is that going to be met? Well, isn't most of the financing going to happen on his Tesla stock anyway, not on the uh, Twitter uh, cap structure? No, there's, so. there's 13 billion, though, that's still going to come with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of interest payments due every year. Uh, you know, I, one calculation I saw, you know, if you looked at actual cash earnings, like, I mean, they're barely covering it now. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, he can, he can, he can cure that default if it gets to that point. But, you know, he, he's pledged about, I think roughly these numbers are right. He's pledged roughly a third of his Tesla stock coming into this. He's pledging another third of his Tesla stock for this. And then he's raising another $13 billion of debt that is recourse to, to Twitter, the company. And that is where the interest burden is going to be massive. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, that is a, an important question to ask for what he's go what he's got planned. Uh, the whisper is he'll move the headquarters to Miami, uh, and that'll save some money. Yeah, that sure. could save whatever you know, fifty million bucks a year. I mean, you certainly have one hundred and sixty million of non cash 
stock-based compensation you could cut right away. Right? I mean, <laughs> so that's all great, but you have a company with five or six billion dollars of revenue and thirteen billion dollars of debt. I mean, this is not. This is one of the most levered acquisitions I can think of. I mean, this is unbelievable. And look, I, I talked to somebody the other day. It was like, oh, don't worry. You know, one of the big private equity firms is going to syndicate down some of the equity risk because you know, again, he's still got to come up with some of the equity by selling Tesla or otherwise, right? So um, maybe he'll do that. And I, I would point out though, the other twelve or thirteen billion, whatever the number is, that's secured by Tesla stock. You know, there's a margin call in the waiting there. If, if Tesla falls, I think something like 35, 40% from here, which, you know, as we've seen, that's a bad day in the market for some of these companies right now, let alone over a longer period of time. So this is not without risk by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, that's for sure. And it's certainly pricing in about as big a merger arm premium as I've seen in recent times. So there's definitely something to that. Well, I think it's because, look, I mean, you know, you now have a merger agreement and it's got all kinds of sort of goofy stuff in it. And this isn't going to close for months. And God only knows what can happen between now and then, right? I mean, this, it, it is a pretty wide merger arm spread. And I mean, if I was playing that game, which I'm not, I would demand a <laughs> spread. I'd be scared out of my wits to, you know, wake up and have this thing blow up in my face for some stupid reason that unfolded it three in the morning, right? I mean, it's just nuts. Unfolded at three in the morning with a tweet, right? <laughs> exactly, right? So the other thing I want to say uh, quickly on this that I just find bizarre is there was an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal this morning praising Twitter's board of directors. And I, I thought, I read it three times, kept thinking I was missing something that there was satire involved, but I think it was serious. And, and the, the gist of the article of the opinion was that Twitter's board was correct in offering Elon a board seat, which I think it was. If you're a 9%, 10% holder, that makes plenty of sense. Uh, they were correct in adopting, uh, in adopting a poison pill when they did, which I agree. That makes plenty of sense in standing up for their shareholders and getting a fair price. And then he seems to think that they got some sort of victory by demanding a breakup fee and a cash payout of all vested options for Twitter employees. And, and by the way, the breakup fee is like 2%. It's nothing juicy or unusual. If anything, it's a little light given how erratic the buyer is. And cashing out your existing employees, like, okay, great. Like, that, again, that very standard. They didn't negotiate a dime of purchase price here. As you said, they stuck with the stupid 420 joke price that Elon put out as his, quote, best and final and caved like a cardboard box in a hurricane. I mean, this this stock is that's so far below where this company traded just a few months ago, and now all of a sudden it's a bargain. And I just have to point out, like, yes, I know there's a Chinese wall involved here, but Goldman Sachs Investment Bankers, and by the way, Goldman was probably the only firm possibly left standing because J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon refused to do any sort of business with Elon Musk, and Morgan Stanley was engaged as Elon's banker. And so Goldman Sachs was already engaged with Twitter's board, presumably on advising it on all manner of stuff. Goldman Sachs investment bankers were telling the company like, boy, yeah, you should probably take this. This is a pretty good deal, even though, you know, you, you had all these plans and the stock price was trading much higher. And, you know, three or four weeks ago, you would have said $54 is an insulting takeout price. At the same time, Goldman's research analysts, which, yes, of course, it's a nominally completely separate arm and separate people had basically a sell rating on Twitter stock and had a target price of, I believe, 30, three zero dollars I mean, you, you just couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. So I, how anyone could look at this and think this was a good outcome is just beyond me. And that's why I say bittersweet, right? I mean, what, what's okay about it is, and I, I'd imagine Goldman and JP Morgan, who was hired as well, their argument was, hey, look, you know, all these stocks, the valuation last year is irrelevant. Um, you know, this is the average multiple out there and therefore it's a good deal. But I think that's, you know, pretty myopic. And I think that's the kind of situation where if Twitter were to be purchased at all, you know, I'd always said the, the beauty of buying a strategically significant asset is it's both a put option and a call op option that you own as the investor where you know someone might step up and buy it for strategic reasons therefore you got your call and if things hit the fan you know there's an out because someone's going to want to buy it for strategic reasons and uh this was the worst kind of put where it's like 
not that things hit the fan of the company itself. It's that the entire sector got marked down in unison. Meanwhile, Twitter was like, people don't like hearing this. It was the single best performing social media stock over the last one, three, and five years. So not like as as bad as the narrative is, it's not that bad. Um, they uh, were in a position to have, they were vulnerable. They were in, in a position to have a 1980s style corporate raider come in and uh, say, give give it to me. Um, and the board just caved. They caved. They didn't even take an extra like couple weeks to be like, hey, let's get earnings out. Let's see what happens. Let's see if the market, uh, you don't want to play the market itself, but you know, they, they kind of closed the deal when the S&P was at its lows of the last year. Um, you might want to like take an extra week to think about it. Best and final offer isn't going away. And Musk gave all indications that he was like not going to go away all that fast anyway. So like, what was the rush? Why did they have to get it done that Monday in the afternoon? I don't know. Wait, Twitter's outperformed. I don't know who else would count as a social media stat. Would Facebook Snapchat, count? Meta, aka Facebook. Uh, yeah, Twitter's been the best of the lot. Over five years? Yep. Wow. I didn't know that. That's surprising to me. Hey, narrative and reality often have a wide gap, right? <laughs> oh, for sure. I would not have guessed that. Yeah, I mean, some of that is some of the recent troubles at Facebook and, you know, Snap and Pins have been down a lot and Twitter, relatively speaking, held in better. Maybe the conclusion that some might draw is that social is a bad place to invest. I'd beg to differ, but, you know, and maybe some would push back at me and say, hey, I'm cherry picking basically the low point in Twitter's public history. But the fact is, that's five years. That's a long time. Who the hell cares if it's the low point or not, you know? Um, The people who are pointing to their IPO price and, you know, basically, now it's better than breaking even, but they're cherry picking too. The stock went public at way too an exp- expensive evaluation. It was going to take a long time to kind of work their way into that uh, expe- expectation. Sure, it took longer than most would have hoped, but yeah, you know that's what happens with valuation. It gets way too high and it gets way too low. Uh, I exactly. I think it might have a lot to do with starting valuation, to say the least, but. Um... Yeah, I guess I'm looking back to 2016. This would be 2017 now. But yeah, it's uh, it's put up pretty good performance since then at a pretty low point. And uh, over the same period, Facebook took about 22% a year for Twitter and yeah, about 6% a year for Facebook. You're right. Wow. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, that's when I started with my Twitter shares and people were like, why don't you just buy Facebook instead? Why don't you just buy Facebook instead? It's like, well, there's something to be said about buying the one that has very low <laughs> embedded expectations. Um, yeah. And obviously, you know, some would say, oh, you know, who knew Elon Musk would buy it at the end? But yeah, you know, you could get m a in a company whose market cap is, you know, in the in the mid cap range. You're not going to get m a in one of the five largest companies in the world. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be tough in this day and age, for sure. This deal is hard enough to pull off. Speaking of uh, very low embedded expectations, Elliot, um, is it time to take a victory lap on uh, FB since last week? I did kind of stick my neck out. Yeah, right. Not not a bad start. <laughs> basically back to where it was last week. That's how bad the, the, the middle of the week was. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, it is a really interesting spot, right? I think you should take a little bit of a victory lap, at least for you know, having the right head on your shoulders when everyone else was getting like extremely myopic. Um, I do think we're in that kind of environment. Some of these prices are going to look, I I mean, personally, I think there's going to be some big dispersion. There are going to be some things that look like, you know, you'll, you'll reflect back on this, like, how did that get that cheap? And there'll be others that are like, oh yeah, you know, it's still the same price in five years from now. But, you know, Facebook's a good candidate for that. People look back on and say, how was that possibly that cheap? Yeah, we'll see. Um, Phil, I know, I know you wanted to talk about some other governance uh, aspects. Uh, we yeah. kind of got stuck on Twitter, but uh, no, no, that's good. My mind? apologies on that one. No, no, I, I wanted to talk about that one too. I mean, the other one that stands out um, as we are in the you know beginning, the, the big part of proxy season and annual meeting season, is these proposals that Berkshire Hathaway is likely going to face this weekend, which are kind of bizarre and look they're 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 across the board but they're they're two big ones that i think are just absurd and but yet are going to get a ton of attention one 
is the idea that every company should be forced to split the role of chairman and CEO, uh, which again, sounds great on its face because every board should be led by someone who's independent from the chief executive role since the board's primary job is to hire and fire the chief executive. But it just ignores reality that there are many, many companies where the CEO is either a long tenured executive with a long, long history of well-deserved success or a founder or something like that, where the job is best handled by the same person. And, and, and by the way, I, I'm a huge fan of always being complimented by a strong independent lead director. Um, it's not like there shouldn't be any checks and balances, but be, by being so prescriptive in this and saying that you should basically take the job away from Warren Buffett, it's just beyond absurd to me. And look, they've already said that when Buffett's no longer chairman and CEO, the role will be split because then by definition, his unique skills and abilities will no longer be in that seat. So yeah, obviously that, that makes plenty of sense, but to force this down every company's throat uh, regardless of the situation, regardless of what its own shareholders want, is just bizarre. And I think the people proposing it have no leg to stand on in terms of their own thoughts, justification, credibility, even their diligence on individual situations. This is just kind of a, a soapbox for them, I, in my opinion. It, it's kind of bizarre. The other one is, uh, you know, the, the forced disclosure on climate change stuff, uh, carbon emissions, which I would be sympathetic to if it were meaningful. Uh, I just don't think it is. I, I'm all in favor of more information and more disclosure in almost every situation. I'm in favor of companies and countries taking steps that they, they have deemed reasonable trade-offs to reduce their carbon footprint and do whatever they can to protect the environment. And of course, to abide by the laws of all the countries in which they're operating. Um, but forcing a bunch of companies that are you know, under one umbrella for corporate legal purposes to fill out a bunch of forms and disclose stuff that has absolutely no meaning, value or utility to anyone is just patently absurd. I mean, you're just, this is how regulatory burdens get out of control, right? I mean, it, it makes all the sense in the world for, the Public Utilities Commission to ask certain utilities to disclose that because that can be done in a very simple, aggregated way at that company level. And that's in an industry where it really matters. But then making Seize Candy report its carbon footprint next to BNSF and, and Berkshire Hathaway Energy is just obviously a total farce. And, and the proportionate share of time and attention that it would demand at each company would be about the same. Right? I mean, you'd still need someone doing the work, collecting the data and reporting it up. And uh, there'd be absolutely no benefit in doing that. It's just totally absurd. So um, I, I continue to see more and more bizarre behaviors between companies that have to engage with their shareholders and these, these sort, of sort of proxy advisors and, you know, these crusaders that don't really have a stake. I mean, I guess some of these guys have actually owned shares, but... They, they don't share the long-term ethos of ownership that I think most companies would want. So you guys disagree or? Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. You know, I mean, by and large, in, there are certain situations where I think you should have a split chair and CEO. So to address the first part, um, you know, I think that's something that uh, in Europe is way more common than it is in the U.S. nowadays. Um, but I think, you know, the bigger problem is you often have board seats that are occupied by people like the example Mike gave, non-GAP gave in, in the PayPal talk, who shouldn't even be there in the first place. You know, you don't even have a payments expert on the board. Um, you have a guy who was put in by an activist at eBay before the split who was supposed to leave after one year and is still there. Um, I think those are like bigger problems. Uh, I, I don't see a problem at all in the case of you know, one of the ultimate shareholder stewards of all time, having both roles, like, how could you complain? And then, you know, the, the other stuff, like those disclosures, the, the burden of it, it's, it's not even like it matters. It's pure theater. Like, what's the point? Uh, it's just like taking your shoes off, going through the TSA, like, come on already. Um, that's how I feel about those things. It's, it's pure theater. Um, and it has no consequence or effect. And I don't understand why we have to waste our time with that. So yeah. Amen. I agree. Yeah, I I totally agree as well. And I think um, it's not just this year. There have been 
ridiculous shareholder proposals at Berkshire uh, annual meetings for for a while, it seems, and um, yeah, most of them are complete garbage. So what, what's the answer then? I mean, you know, in a world where fewer and fewer shares are held and voted by individuals or institutions actually paying attention, and more and more shares are held by indexers that don't pay attention and don't vote most of the time. And you have this vacuum that's being filled by these agitators. What do we do? Is there a solution? Well, I think, you know, there are companies, Berkshire is obviously uh, an exception, an aberration in corporate America. I mean, you have a guy running it who has a huge equity interest and who actually cares about the minority shareholders, uh, even beyond his own um, equity interest. Um, so that's really not um, an example you can take for the rest of corporate America. I think in the rest of corporate America, there's little hope uh, because of what you described, which is passive shareholders who don't really care. Um, the companies hire all kinds of consultants and advisors and pay them big fees to basically tell them what the uh, CEO and the board want to hear. And, um, and that's basically a tax on, um, on investors. I don't see that changing. So, you know, my thoughts on this are nuanced. I think oftentimes with great things, you got to take the bad with them. And I think, you know, that's part of what a corporate structure involves. Someone who has just one share has a say, and they could raise these ideas and you can have a vote on it, but hey, they're probably, I mean, they're definitely not going to win. And, you know, one of the, I think, almost funny examples of that is you see the headlines, Carl Icahn, who has run many successful proxy fights in his life now, is taking on McDonald's over their treatment of animals. And he's doing it with 200 shares. This is a guy who's a billionaire, but he's doing it with 200 shares, just like some of these people at Berkshire are doing it. You know, that's what it is. You you get a voice. Um, so I don't know how you get away from it. I don't know how you work around it. Um, but hey, we all got to vote. And I think it's part of why when you're a shareholder, you should exercise that right to vote. That is what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I, it's a dual process for me. I mean, you, you vote with your wallet and you vote when you actually have shares. And yeah, I mean, I guess the, the distinction I would draw, the Carl Icahn thing is really interesting at McDonald's is, um, I, to me, it just passes the reasonableness test, right? I mean, he's got a very specific, very narrow issue that the company could take action on, right? And I think it's coming from a place where he feels strongly. And if the company disagrees and the rest of the shareholders disagree, then that's fine. It's not creating this, you know, growing lifelong mountain of regulatory red tape that serves absolutely no one, right? I mean, the, the, the disclosures around carbon emissions from companies that aren't in that business is just, I, I don't see how that benefits literally anyone. Um, so it, as much as I would be aligned with the hopes uh, and the intentions of those types of people, I just think it's so misguided, it's counterproductive. And yeah, with the chairmanship thing, I mean, again, it's, I, I think you're right. I think you just have to live with it because you're always going to have things brought up that aren't well thought out or aren't aren't really productive and you just have to deal with it. And I think this is why, you know, it gets back to what you said right away at the very beginning of this, which is to get the shareholders you deserve. <laughs> so for companies that have been smart and intelligent about building out their shareholder base, they'll be fine. They've got the shareholders they deserve. Everybody else is going to have to fight it out a different way. It's not going to be as fun for them. Yeah. You know, I think that's proving to be a bigger problem in this environment than any, like, a lot of money is much shorter term than I even thought in the market. I think too many cycles have happened in the last two years and it's just going uh, away from like true fundamentals. And there's so many people who, uh, who just focus on like the latest direction. Uh, everyone's a momentum trader at the end of the day is what one, one of my buddies says. And he's actually a momentum trader and he knows it when he sees it, but you know, he was speaking of fundamental, uh, theoretically fundamental investors. Um, I think there's a lot of that out there right now. And you get the shareholders you deserve. I think some of these companies should be a little better in how they uh, 
communicate. I think they're one of, one of the big issues I've had lately is there are a lot of companies who, when things were really good, had an arrogance about disclosure. Um, and I think a lot of companies hide behind the, oh, if I disclose this, it'll maybe give my competitors an advantage. Even if like by and large, there's no freaking way that is the case. And I think companies should be a lot better with disclosure about their business. I'm not talking about like carbon emissions. I'm talking about like, you know, who their customers are, how they behave, what they're doing. And I think, you know, um, now that things are less good, it's going to be a lot harder for some of these companies to hide behind the excuses they've been putting forward. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But it, it gets back to the issue of building credibility, right? I mean, if you come at this in a, in a spirit of disclosure and governance of saying, I'm running this company as I would want it to be run if I were on the other side. If I were a minority holder of this and I were entrusting someone else to run it, how would I want that person to do his or her job? And if if management behaves that way, they build credibility, they build trust, everybody wins. If you act like you're the last pig at the trough and you've just got to get as much for yourself as you possibly can, and you're constantly playing hide the pickle with disclosure and every nonsense game you could ever make up and just trying to see how far you can push it and see what you can get away with, you're obviously not going to have any trust and any goodwill built up and you're going to get what you deserve and it generally doesn't end well. Yeah, I agree with you, Phil. Um, you know, we just are in, in a market environment where companies get rewarded for far too long for playing games. You know, I mean, just take AMC. I mean, how have they treated their shareholders who, you know, kind of uh, act like this is a religious issue if you support AMC or not? And meanwhile, the management is selling stock every chance they have and just doing ridiculous things with shareholders' money. And yet they have a they they trade at valuation multiples that would allow them to roll up uh, the whole freaking industry for stock and uh, make a killing. So you know, I, I feel like when you have so many gullible investors out there and such valuation disparities. In a lot of these uh, industries, uh, you know, you take a, a Toyota versus a Tesla in terms of valuation multiples. There's a kind of a strategic reason for a company like Tesla to very selectively share what they want to share to maintain those valuation multiples, so they can keep raising money whenever they need at uh, super high prices. And um, and so there's there's just a bunch of issues in the market right now that I don't see going away. And, um, you know, I feel like every individual investor just can only guard against this by being educated and then, um, you know, putting putting your money where you feel like you're being treated uh, the right way. Yeah, it's funny. The AMC thing is a fascinating example. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to make of it in a lot of ways, because I actually used it in my MBA class yesterday. And one of the students said a couple of things. One was how could this possibly still be going on after a year and be taken as just some sort of irrational mob mentality? Because what I did was that I've done this, it's been a year and a half or more since we've done it on the podcast, but I do a blind valuation where I just present the financials the stated actual financials going back five or six years, the current year estimates, I tell them roughly what sort of business it is. And I ask for a range, as wide a range as they care to give. The range could start with, I would only pay $1 for this equity and go up to 10 billion or whatever, right? But the whole point is like most people get a bunch of data in front of them and feel compelled to put too narrow a range, which I'm trying to train them out of. And then two is that they just have this massive oh my gosh, kind of moment when they put a number out there and realize that what they're looking at is a failing movie chain, movie theater chain. And it's been propped up by this bizarre, you know, social media phenomenon. But what's really fascinating about AMC is the guy running it is no dummy and he's doing this very intentionally, right? I mean, he has a long career of, I mean, he was the CEO of, I think it was Norwegian or Caribbean, one of the cruise lines, CEO of Vail Resorts, now CEO of this of AMC. And he's almost taken a page from the Elon Musk and now the Twitter playbook of where you just lean into this nonsense, right? You, you, you embrace the, 
the crowds and you embrace the apes or whatever shareholder base you have at, at AMC and say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stoke their fury and fan the flames and and play off of it. And then he's going out and buying gold mines to bail out one of his big shareholders and all this other unbelievable stuff. But to your point, John, I mean he he has a fiduciary duty if the stock is still there available to be sold at a price you'd almost think he has to do it, right? If his, if his moral conscience won't let him do it, he should resign. I guess otherwise you have a responsibility to go out and feed the ducks as long as they're quacking. At least that's the argument that a lot of these MBAs were making. And I was sitting there thinking like, wow, I mean, you know, it, it's just not something that you would ever really stop to think about in advance. It's like, what do you do if my otherwise failing enterprise suddenly has the price go up 10x almost overnight? <laughs> because of a bunch of unrelated nonsense. Like, what would you do? Like, how would you handle that? And how would you respond to your shareholders? It's just bizarre. Yeah, good good question. I don't, I don't have an answer. I don't either. I truly don't. I mean, I, I, it's easy to sit here and say like, oh, I'd do the right thing or I'd resign or whatever. I don't think most people really would. And it, it's sort of like Hertz too, right? Like when Hertz was in bankruptcy in 20. I guess they filed in 2020, and as they were going through the process uh, about a year later, and it caught some of this meme stock gyration, and they tried to sell equity to the public, where in the prospectus they said explicitly, we believe this stock is worthless and has no value, and yet we're selling it to you anyway. And ultimately, the SEC and the judge stepped in and halted it uh, before it ever really got going. But, you know, I mean, you have duties to maximize value for the estate in that situation. And if you can maximize values for the estate, let alone create this weird reflexive feedback loop that ultimately came about anyway, where it, it stoked other bidders and put a price tag on the company that would have been completely and totally unjustifiable prior to this whole thing. And it, it worked, right? in a lot of ways it worked. And the company came out with an equity recovery and a price that was way higher and the bonds and the creditors all reco recovered a lot more than they ever would have, thanks to what I would describe only as a, as a mass delusion, right? I don't know what else you could call it. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny world we live in. I mean, you know, we're, we're arguing multiples of a movie theater chain, which you can argue. And, uh, you know, we think it's ridiculous where AMC is trading, but then you have things like Dogecoin, that also have billions in supposed value and uh you know how does that happen so i i feel like you know maybe elon musk is right that we we do live in a simulation and uh we should just enjoy it and have fun with it yes yeah i mean that's that's certainly <laughs> one takeaway from this right scratching my head over here yep exactly he who controls the memes right yep yeah, I guess that's the, the last word for our discussion today. Thanks so much, guys, Phil and Elliot. Uh, it was uh, another fun one, and I hope everyone listening uh, enjoyed it as well. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.